Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we are going back to the marker and paper style and we'll be doing the same thing for a couple of other videos as well. I'm doing this because I want to see which style you all like better. Um, I've gotten some comments on past videos, people that really like this style because there's less distractions in the screen. Uh, some people like the whiteboard style because it looks like there's a real person delivering this information to you. I'm not really partial to either one. I just want to do the one that works best for most people. So please do leave feedback in this video. So let's talk about the main event, which is Shapley values. Shapley values are an extremely powerful and commonly used technique in machine learning to interpret the way a model works. So whenever we use something that's even slightly complicated for a model, we always have this kind of problem that we're not exactly sure why the model is doing what it's doing. And Shapley values are a very important way to answer that question. So let's do a setup. Let's say that you own an ice cream shop near the airport. So this is my best drawing of your ice cream shop. And this is a plane, not a bird. And so this is your ice cream shop near the airport. Now let's say that you're building a model, which is going to be using the following four features to predict the number of cones, the number of ice cream cones that you're going to be selling on any given day. And these four features are temperature in Fahrenheit, sorry to my Celsius friends, day of the week, which is just some integer between zero and six. Let's say zero is Monday and six is Sunday the number of flights coming into the airport that day and the number of hours that your shop is open that day. We want to build some kind of model that uses these four features to predict the number of cones sold. And in a picture that's just given by this simple graphic right here, features go in, this is your model and the prediction of number of cones sold comes out. I've very purposely drawn this model in a black box because it literally does not matter what your model is. That's one of the beautiful things about Shapley values. It is what's called model agnostic. And that's just a fancy way of saying that it doesn't matter what your model is, this process is going to be the same, which is very nice. And so putting in some real numbers that we'll work with in this video, let's say the temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's say it's a Tuesday. Let's say there's 100 flights coming in today and let's say your shop is open for four hours. Your model, let's say, predicts that 1000 cones will get sold today. The question that Shapley values answers and a question that we very much care about is how much does each of these features contribute to the difference between this prediction and the average prediction. So let me break that down a little bit. There's a couple of things to break down in what I just said. So let's focus on just one of these features because it'll be the same story for all of them. Let's say we're trying to figure out how much does this fact that temperature is equal to 80 degrees Fahrenheit contribute to the difference between this prediction, which again is a thousand, the difference between that and the average prediction, which let's say is 2000. Where did I get this average prediction from? Well, I didn't state it, but there's some kind of underlying data set behind the scenes, which was used to train this model. Let's say that we run this model on every single one of those samples in that data frame, and we get that the average number of cones sold predicted is 2000. So the big question we want to ask is that clearly this is not 2000. Clearly this particular sample is getting a prediction of 1000. So where is that discrepancy of negative 1000 coming from? Clearly each of these features is partially responsible for it. And we would like to know how much responsibility does each of these features claim for that difference. So it might be that one of them is kind of contributing for most or all of it, or maybe they're kind of sharing it equally. That's the big question we want to answer with Shapley values. And so again, we'll just be focusing right now on how much does the fact that temperature equals 80 degrees Fahrenheit contribute to this difference of negative 1000. Now, before jumping into Shapley values and saying, here's the formulas, uh, you know, that's not the way we do it on this channel. Let's talk about a more simplistic idea. Why use something complicated if something simple is going to do the job? So first I want to show you something simple and talk about why it may not be doing the job. So idea number one, let's fix the values of all the other features. Currently we only care about temperature, right? So let's fix the values of day of the week, number of flights coming in, and number of hours you're open. That's why you're seeing the same one, 104 in all three of these guys. The only thing that's changing is the first feature, which again is the temperature. And where are these numbers coming from? Well, again, you have some underlying data frame behind the scenes. You're just going to randomly sample some temperature, boop, put it there. Randomly sample some other temperature, boop, put it there. Randomly sample some other temperature, boop, put it there. So that's where these kind of Frankenstein samples come in. I call them Frankenstein samples because they're kind of uh, samples created from pieces of other things. Part of them is from the original sample and part of them is a randomly chosen thing. We run these Frankenstein samples through our model. And let's say here we get a predicted number of cones of 1100, 500, and 300. Now we go ahead and take the difference between our actual predicted number from the original sample, 1000 minus 1100 gives us negative 100. 1000 minus 500 is 500. 1000 minus 300 is 700. 
And so we wouldn't just do three of these, even though that's just the number of space I had here. We would do many, many, many of these. It's a pretty easy and efficient process to do. And then we would take the average of all of these differences, and that might be an answer to our question. Because what that's intuitively saying is that what's the average change in the prediction if I go from my original sample, which again was this guy, to some other temperature, some randomly chosen temperature. And maybe that's a way to answer my question. Agreed, this could be a way to answer your question. And this is very much in the spirit of partial dependence plots, or PDPs, which we talked about in a previous video, which I'll link below. But as we talked about in that video, partial dependence plots have this big problem that you may be creating improbable or impossible samples along the way. And that comes from this Frankenstein nature. For example, let's say that in the summer months, the temperature is likely to be higher, but the number of flights is also likely to be higher. People travel more during the summer when they get a break or when the temperature is nicer. So maybe it doesn't make sense for some of these samples that we've just created. Maybe it doesn't make sense for super high temperatures, but really low uh, number of flights, for example. But this process doesn't care about that. And that could lead to some serious problems. Another kind of subtle issue is that we're only getting isolated effects here. What I mean by that is that we have chosen to fix these other three variables and just kind of shift this temperature up and down, pick some randomly chosen samples from our data set. Seems fine in theory, uh, but we might be caring about a more nuanced thing when we answer this question about how much does temperature equals 80 contribute. Maybe we care about how much does it contribute when something else is changing with it. Maybe when another feature or another couple features are varying with it. So we're kind of not getting all the information we could be extracting using this very simple technique. But it's important nonetheless to talk about this technique because it's going to lead us into Shapley values. So now the rest of this video is just going to be me going through the step-by-step -step process of Shapley values with you. And I will be focusing a lot on interpretation because at the end of the day, we're trying to interpret this. So what's the use if I just throw formulas at you? So step one is to get a random permutation of the features. So I've given the features just single letter names to be uh, convenient, but we have T for temperature, D for day of the week, F for number of flights, and H for number of hours. Those are the letters you see here. We get a random permutation of these features. If you haven't uh, studied permutations in a while, that just means a random ordering of these features. And let's say this is the ordering that we get. Now again, don't forget through this whole process that we currently care about temperature. So we put a bracket under temperature and everything that's to its right. And in this case, that's just one other variable, which is the number of hours that were open that day. But if you had a different random permutation, you would have different things in this set here. The next thing we do is we pick a random sample from the data set. This is just completely random sample we pluck from the data set. And let's say it looks like this. The number of flights is 200. The day of the week is 5, temperature is 70 degrees, and the number of hours we're open is 8 hours. And now we're going to do a similar thing to what we did before. We're going to form two Frankenstein vectors. And those vectors are going to be taken partially from our original sample that we care about and from this random sample that we just pulled. And the crucial thing is that the way we consider which features come from which vector, whether it's the randomly chosen one or the original one, is that we look at this bracket that we drew here, which is the temperature and the number of hours that were open that day. So keep that in mind. So the first Frankenstein vector, which we call x1, is going to have all the same values from our original sample. So that's these blue things you're seeing here. And we're going to look at which of these guys is in this bracket. And we see that it's h as well as t. But since t is the thing we care about, we're going to leave that the same here. So for this x1, we leave t the same and we change h to the randomly chosen value of h. That's where this 8 comes from here. And for x2, we again keep 100 and 1 the same. We keep f and d the same because they were not included in this bracket after we did this random permutation. Except here, we also do change the 8. So we change the 8 just like we did for this upper Frankenstein sample. But crucially, we also change the temperature to the randomly chosen temperature here, which is 70. Now, many or most, probably all of you, are very confused at this moment because as I'm delivering this information, I realize that I'm kind of just talking. But let me go through exactly what this represents because this is the key step. Step three is the key step here. So we're forming two Frankenstein samples. And the first thing to know about these guys is that these are the exact same samples except for one thing. They vary only in their temperatures. And that is a crucial thing because they're basically different on only one feature, which is the feature we care about. 
Now, the whole reason we did the step one, which is getting a random permutation of features, is that we're saying that, okay, for these two features here, T and H, we are going to get those from a randomly chosen sample. And that's where the 70 and this 8 come from. For these other features, F and D, we say we're going to leave those alone. We're going to take the values of those from our original sample, and that's why you see this 100 and 1, this 100 and 1. The reason we do that is to account for one of these issues here, which says that we're only getting isolated effects when we do this kind of partial dependence plot analysis. Now we're saying that, actually, I'm going to take some feature values from a random vector and some feature values from my original vector so that I'm not getting as many of these isolation issues, so that now some things are changing together. And that also happens to deal with this first one, which is creating improbable samples. We could still very much get improbable samples through the Shapley values technique, but at least we are kind of keeping batches of features together. For example, this 101 are not improbable together because they came from the same exact vector, namely the vector we were originally looking at. And this 70 and 8 are not improbable because they both came from a randomly chosen sample. So this actually occurred in the real world, and therefore we're keeping these together. And so we're kind of mitigating the effect of these improbable combinations of features. So now that we hopefully understand that, we go ahead and run this first one, x1 through our model, and we get that the prediction is 1500 cones sold, and x2 through our model, and we get that the prediction here is 1400 cones sold. We take the difference, and we get plus 100. What does that difference represent? Remember, again, the key thing is the only difference between these two vectors is that this one has the value of temperature that we currently care about. What is the effect from temperature equals 80? And so we're saying going from something else to temperature equals 80, we are getting an increase of 100 cones sold, and that's the difference. So I would encourage you to go ahead and pause, rewind, write on a piece of paper, make sure you understand the intuition about why this step makes sense because after you do, the rest is going to be very trivial here. So step four is to record that difference. So we go ahead and take this plus 100, we put it in a list somewhere, and then we just return to step one, get a new random permutation of features, which probably won't look like this, and then go through this process again, pick a new random sample from the data set, form these x1 and x2 Frankenstein vectors, which are again only going to be different on this one feature temperature, and then record that difference, put it in our running list of differences, and so on and so on. And after we've collected many, 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 many of these, however many we are confident with, the Shapley value for temperature is equal to 80, given this sample that we care about, is equal to the expected difference of all those differences that we've collected. And this makes sense because this is basically saying that if we go from a randomly chosen Frankenstein vector, which is x2, to x1, which also is a randomly chosen Frankenstein vector, but with the key difference that it always has this equals to 80, then the expected difference is going to be this guy here. So we're saying that by setting temperature equals 80, you're getting an added boost, or it could be a decline, whatever, whether it's positive or negative, you're getting a change of exactly this amount, and that is called the Shapley value. And now we repeat this process for all feature values. So let's say that the Shapley value for temperature equals 80 was 200, which means that we're getting an increase of 200 cones sold by having temperature equals 80 in our sample. And let's say that the Shapley values for it being a Tuesday, for 100 flights coming in, and we're open four hours today, are negative 600, negative 400, and negative 200, respectively. So now we have exactly what we were looking for in the beginning. We have the contribution of each feature's value to the difference between our given prediction and the average prediction. And step six, you can even kind of bubble this up to the entire model's feature importances. For example, this is just one sample, right? But you have many, many samples in your data frame. So you go ahead and run the Shapley value analysis for every single value in your data frame. You can take the absolute value because you really just care about the magnitude here and you take the average of each feature's Shapley values across all samples in your data frame, and you get something that looks like this. So for example, across all samples, the day of the week matters the most in explaining the difference between a given prediction and the average prediction, followed by the number of flights, followed by the temperature that day, followed by how many hours you're open, and this is a model agnostic framework. Notice that we didn't use anything about this being a decision tree or neural network or linear regression, it does not matter. This is a model agnostic framework for getting these feature contributions, which is a very, very important tool in interpreting your machine learning model. 
All right, so if you learned about Shabley values, please leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.